I decided to come in and participate in open studio uh, right before spring break. I uh, was discussing um, with our veterinary technology students what was going on in the world, um, both the actuality of it because we're a health science and uh, just the fact that every day we get to make a choice about acting from a place of fear or a place of love. Uh, and I had this story on my desk because it has some pertinent uh, veterinary technology information in it. And I almost shared it with them, uh, but, but I didn't. We jumped into our review questions for our final exam. And uh, it seemed like the perfect opportunity to share this, this happy memory. The arts are imperative in a time like this in terms of keeping our hearts open and continuing to act from a place of love and not letting fear crowd us out uh, in both our behaviors and in, into our openness towards change. I think everyone's familiar with that idea that crisis is opportunity um, and staying open to personal changes, cultural changes, uh, and asking the hard questions and stories and song and uh, graphic arts, it all uh, asks those questions and asks us to stay open. Saving Chile. For 26 years, I lived in Alaska and I have never seen Alaska reality TV. Down in the San Luis Valley of Colorado, I frequently visited an elderly woman who bottle raised kittens. She lived in an adobe house in the middle of nowhere. In her younger years, she raised camels. Her entryway was occluded by the canned cheese, pasta, and nutrition drinks the food bank kept dropping off. She'd recap whichever Alaska series she was watching at the time in such a way that her summary went on as long as the show itself. It's hard to find any Alaskan who deny we are tough. We think of ourselves as hardy, independent rule breakers. Cold is the first word that condenses in people's minds when they hear the word Alaska. Interior Alaska has honest winters. We do see temperatures of minus 30, minus 40, and less frequently minus 50 or minus 60 below zero Fahrenheit. If you are optimistic and dress appropriately, Alaska's cold is only clumsy. It's a hassle. We all save a few tasks for when the cold snap ends after a week or so, when it warms back up to minus 10, then you can see about fixing the latch on the gate or getting that old chair out of the shed. Alaska's famous cold arrives with mystical eccentricities. Clear refractile light creates a sun halo or even parhelia, which have been colloquially called sun dogs for centuries. The funny little rainbows 22 degrees to the left or right of the sun created by the shape and alignment of ice crystals. Finding the origin of the term sun dog leaves leads to muddy conjecture about how dogs stay close, as if the sun had bacon or kind words. Yet there is nothing domestic about being outside in the air to witness the beauty. In Alaska's extreme cold, the nearness of death is palpable. Our frailty is luminous. In February of 2014, I was working at North Pole Veterinary Hospital just outside of Fairbanks, Alaska. The temperature had plunged almost 50 below that week, not cold enough to cancel school, but cold enough to cancel school recess and a wide variety of other things. Every time someone opened the front door, we were assaulted with a gust of cold air. You could feel it even back in the treatment area, a sharp plunge of cold coiling through the thin cotton of our scrub pants. Plumes of exhaust from cars idling in the parking lot added an unearthly haze to the pink gray sky. We were pushing on, business as usual, I was setting up to take x-rays on a limping Labrador when Marta came back, her pace rapid, with something swaddled in a blanket that was making a horrible, wailing noise. Marta blurted, walk in. These people live three hours out of town. Dr. Tan was at the cat's side before Marta even had the bundle of frayed blanket on the treatment table. They say he wasn't doing that, this wailing, until halfway here. Tan put down the chart in her hands. The puppy vaccine appointment would wait. Laurel used the fast reading thermometer and announced temp is 97.5 before speeding off to get warming bags. While Dr. Tan checked the pupillary light response, the cat's eyes were fixed on something both distant and internal, barely responding to the ophthalmoscope. Nor could she maintain a sitting position, instead keeling over and less stabilized. Marta was already trying to place a catheter in the leg. Do we have authorization? Dr. Tan asked looking hopefully for a receptionist who had any information at all about the client's financial status. 
The cat's vocalizing became so deafening. Tan had to shout, did we get a wait for a dose of Buprenex? We, we quickly administered the pain relief injection. It turned out that Oscar was a six-year-old cream-colored neutered male cat who was the owner's dear friend. My dad gave him to me for Christmas after my sister died, Tiffany managed to say when we finally got a history. I just moved into a new house after my divorce, like four days ago, just me and Oscar. Her voice quavered. Oscar's medical case was puzzling. He had signs of kidney failure, diabetes, infection, and obstipation. When a pet's colon is so completely impacted with feces, it becomes life-threatening. We started treatments for each in a stepwise fashion. Oscar's howling subsided, putting us all more at ease. But then he lay on his side in his heated kennel, panting even though his body temperature was below normal. We injected supplements to correct for his low calcium. We added insulin to get the blood sugar down. You never realize what a wondrous machine the body is until you attempt to regulate its cellular level processes externally, adding and removing tiny drops of fluids at certain times in an attempt to measure and mimic all the internal chemical whispering between body systems. It's like trying to tie shoelaces on a Barbie doll, all that fumbling around. Yet Oscar's body responded only marginally to our ministering. By the end of the day in the clinic, he'd attempted to raise his head when you stroked the length of his soft, recumbent body. He stayed overnight on intravenous fluids. When we entered the clinic in the morning, at first glance, Oscar seemed improved. He was sitting upright in his kennel, in the tucked position of a contented cat, legs curled under him and tail curled around his body. He wasn't panting. But when we brought him out for his morning exam, the gravity of the situation became apparent. Oscar had been on intravenous fluids overnight. His kennel should have been flooded with urine, or at the very least, his bladder should have been full. Instead, his whole body had the doughy feel of a water balloon. His kidneys had completely shut down. Dr. Tan pulled her hands out of Oscar's soft fur, looked up, and shook her head. I'll call her. I tucked a blanket around Oscar and moved through the start of the morning's paces, flipping toggle switches, entering passwords into computers, opening the scheduling software. Dr. Tan came back with the look of defeated acceptance, the unmistakable look of resolve that precludes euthanasia. It turns out, she started, that Tiffany and Oscar moved into a house that had been empty for several months. This morning, she found antifreeze in the toilet she hadn't been using. Adding antifreeze to the toilet bowl to prevent freezing and sewage problems is common in Alaska. Ethylene glycol first came into use in the late 19th century as a fabulous chemical upon which our entire automotive industry rides. But it tastes like a sweet melted snow cone and, once inside the body for more than 12 hours, it creates billions of kitchen knife-shaped crystals inside the kidneys, macerating those essential organs. Dr. Avery Tan was, like me, a transplant from the East Coast. Unlike me, she'd made her move to Alaska at midlife, after veterinary school at Cornell and multiple visits. She was a dog musher. Tan had the warm sense of humor a good preschool teacher needs, and she had a kind, facile heart. She was a petite woman with long, graying, natural brown hair. Though she loved dogs and had a mushing team of her own, she loved other species just as much. Around hissing elderly cats, she'd speak like a ventriloquist, I'm going to beat you people with my cane. And with tiny kittens, she'd mock cower in fear at any predatory moves. And she had her own little euthanasia song for cats. A jaunty elementary school, I like tuna, I like catnip. It was this song she sang as Oscar's chin came to rest on his paw and she removed the empty syringe from his vein. We threw ourselves into the rest of the day, quickly dispelling the sting behind our eyes. And then another walk-in, a young couple, the woman clutching a blanket looking terrified. As soon as she saw me, she handed me the weightless burden. We found her in an empty cabin we own and we went to check on we... I lifted the corner of the blanket to look. Is she alive? The woman pleaded. I didn't have an answer for her. My hand fled to the woman's shoulder in an attempt to reassure her, but I swept the bundle off to the back before I could even speak. Inside the blanket was the breathing skeletal remains of a cat. It should have weighed 10 or 11 pounds, and it weighed barely four. The heart rate should have been 180 or higher, and it was 60. 
The cat's pupils were pinpricks that did not respond to light. At some point, the cat's fur had been a calico or tortoiseshell color, but it was a muted oatmeal color, felted into mats in most places. Matted fur has no thermal properties. And as I stared at the creature lying flaccid on the treatment table, I noticed it was not shivering or responding to stimuli at all. I tried one digital thermometer, it wouldn't read. Then I tried another, with no result. This cat's temperature was below 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Can you find us a mercury thermometer? I quietly asked Laurel, noticing how I always got super calm when there was a real crisis. Most often, the nearly deceased cats people whisk to a clinic as emergencies are pets that have been living with chronic renal failure, diabetes, or some other wasting disease for a long time. Sometimes the owners were aware of the cat's illness and had not scheduled a euthanasia soon enough in the progression of the illness. Other times, they were benignly caught up in their own human lives, unable to notice things becoming critical. The couple that had brought the cat in the clinic that day knew only they owned a cabin standing empty and locked for six weeks. They'd never owned a cat or even seen one around until that day. The heat had been off. The cat lay in the middle of the floor when they arrived. We rarely jump into heroics for cats in a condition like the one in front of us that day. I knew to draw blood before putting in a catheter and delivering fluids so our laboratory values would be authentic. I wet the cat's neck with alcohol and pressed the tip of my finger into the jugular furrow. But something was wrong. This was a healthy vessel. It was a spongy, slithery, elastic vessel with normal volume, pulse, and responsiveness to pressure. Nothing about my manipulation of the vessel made me think, oh, it's probably hyperthyroidism, kidney disease, or toxicosis. My syringe easily filled with blood, creating a satisfying steamy condensation at the base of the plunger as I drew back. It's trite to say, but something in my heart flickered with hope. The cat's legs were rigidly extended in front of its body, as if it was pushing itself away from the dinner table. This made it easy to place an intravenous catheter. I wrapped a tiny rubber band around the upper part of the leg as a tourniquet, and I took the cat's paw in my hand. The paw was too soft. This cat was young. I pumped the paw and let the blood pressure build. The front leg vessel was young as well, the size of a strand of angel hair pasta. My catheter slipped right in. An intravenous catheter in a sick animal is a direct line to control the situation. We could now warm up fluids and deliver them, control seizures if they occurred, euthanize if needed. There was no mercury thermometer to be had, but I began the warming process. When Dr. Tan came over, I was lifting the cat up and down over the treatment table like a weightlifter, while Laurel wrapped the cat's entire body in bubble wrap, another trick to keep frail patients warm and insulated. Initially, Dr. Tan was as dubious as I. We just lost Oscar. Some days in a veterinary clinic are just like that. Everything dies. But Dr. Tan lifted the cat's lips and, like my experience with the vital elasticity of the vessels, we both were startled by the young pink gingiva and clean teeth. Maybe as old as Oscar, Tan said, her voice lilting upwards in surprise. Six, tops, maybe as young as four. If you are too exuberant with intravenous fluid therapy in a critical cat, you can kill her with your rescue. The cat's fluid rate was eight milliliters per hour. That is 1.5 teaspoons of intravenous fluids per hour. Cats are small, fierce creatures. The printer in the lab made its shuffling, gulping sound, and I walked over. Where was all my hope coming from? And why, for this particular animal? One page prints the blood chemistries, the tests done on the fluid portion of blood that indicate organ function and metabolism. The second page prints the analysis of the cells in the blood, giving information about infection, bone marrow health, and more. The machine prints both numbers and an abacus-like visual of where these numbers fall in the normal range. I looked down, and two pages and the boxes lined up right down the middle. Normal. Perfectly normal. As if jarred from a stupor, Dr. Tan blinked at the results. Somehow she sensed my electric optimism for this pet. And still feeling her sadness, she proceeded to give me a very stern lecture about the perils of rewarming and refeeding. The cat's prognosis remained grave. There was possible organ shutdown and tissue damage. There was the balancing act of not introducing nutrition until the hydration was just right. 
and there was the added complication of where we were in our workday. Our clinic would close in the next 90 minutes. The temperature outside our doors was 140 degrees less than what the cat's body temperature should be. She would die overnight, if not in a veterinary hospital, and the drive to the emergency clinic would take at least 15 minutes. To begin rewarming and then chill an animal again, that was certain death. All of this, of course, was contingent upon the Good Samaritans who found her in their empty house being willing to spend hundreds of dollars on four pounds of the cat remnant. They want to do it, Dr. Tan said as she came out of the office, walking over to where I had the bubble wrap cat nested in a cardboard box, surrounded by warmed liter bags of saline. Tan peered into the box skeptically and then reached in to scoop up the creature and lay her on the table beside the box. She loosened the bubble wrap and attempted to sit the cat upright, sternal, as we call it. The cat immediately retracted her legs, tucked them under her chest like a normal cat, but then listed to the side like a drunken sailor. Tan unwrapped the cat further to take a temperature. The thermometer still was not reading. The cat tremored with the effort of holding her head up for Tan to look at her pupillary light response. It had returned. I did everything within my power to make sure the cat was safely transferred to the emergency clinic. I called ahead and told them to pre-warm the kennel. I faxed them the blood work results with handwritten admonitions all over it that they must absolutely keep this cat warm and not kill her with zealous refeeding. The couple who'd initially dropped the cat off came back. I lectured them about keeping the car warm. I lectured them about how, once I gave them the cardboard box and the little cat, they were not to stop for gas or coffee, that nothing beyond going the speed limit to the emergency clinic was what they should do. I tried to take the cat's temperature one more time before her departure, but it still didn't read. Her pupils were normal. Her heart rate was now 120. From deep within her little body, there was the faintest rumble of purring. And that really is the essence of life to do the best we can and let go of the results. We send our efforts out into the world and we wait. Sometimes we wait decades, sometimes months or weeks. Rarely is it only hours. I woke in my dark bedroom at 3 a.m. I lay there thinking about the day. Was the cat alive? I'd worked in our small town's veterinary emergency clinic. I had done that shift from 1 a.m. to 7 a.m when even the veterinarian was sleeping and you were left alone to pace, chew gum, check on patients, wish the phone would ring. In 15 years as a veterinary technician, I had never called the emergency clinic to see how a transferred patient was doing. That night, I did. Clearly over-caffeinated, a young man answered the phone. I started, hi, this is a strange call, something I've never done, but I'm a vet tech that worked with a hypothermic, emaciated cat that was transferred there last night and was hoping to see how it was doing. The young man stuttered a little as he thought through the confidentiality clause. You mean chilly? Oh, yeah, well, it's tough. We try and only share with the owners. We, is it alive? I blurted. There was a brief pause. Then, in disbelief, the young man replied, alive? Oh, man, chilly is aggressively friendly. She's doing great. Here, listen. I remembered the length of the telephone cord in that emergency clinic. It was designed so you could talk to a panicked owner while flushing a catheter or switching the laundry. He held the phone up to the cat's cage. The purring vibrated through the phone line, broken only by a meow of greeting, then another, then more purring. Chili was adopted by her rescuers, Sandy and Tom. She glossed up and filled out. Her checkups were always a bright spot in our day. Sandy would tell us how Chili beat up the dog in order to get to his food bowl, how she liked to play fetch with a particular toy, or how she didn't leave Tom's side when she had the, when he had the flu. When her coat returned, she was indeed a tortoiseshell colored cat. We entered her age in her chart as five years, which would have landed her birthday right around the time of the global financial crisis in 2008. We got great mileage out of the jokes that she was a special kind of cat manufactured during the economic downturn to withstand famine and freezing temperatures. And that's all it was, starvation and hypothermia, a little body pulsing with life, pushed to the very edge and enduring for the memory of warm sunlight and a kind heart, kind hand. 
Alaska is explicit with her cold and dark, but winter comes to us in many forms. When we are wrapped inside those dim months, we forget about the beauty. We forget about the light that dips down to our faces and how we can turn to one another and find it there as well. But spring does come, and it's made more glorious by what went before. <laughs>